Hey everybody, Jason here. So in this video, I want to talk a little bit about solo canoe tripping. From time to time, I get emails from people who have been watching my videos and uh, just looking for advice or, you know, my opinion. And this week I got an email from a young woman uh, named Maddie. Uh, she writes, I'm not going to re read you the entire email, but basically she writes that she's an 18-year-old from Markham, Ontario. Uh, she's been to Algonquin Park a few times backcountry camping uh, with summer camp. Uh, she says, this summer I decided to attempt my first solo trip. Uh, she has been watching some of my YouTube videos and she's been on at least five canoe trips uh, before, but was wondering if I had any advice for her. So then she asked some very specific questions and I want to answer them in this video and also give a little bit of advice about solo canoe tripping in Algonquin Park, but also other places. Now I want to also say that there have been other videos about canoe tripping in Algonquin Park. I've watched them and agree with the majority of the points that uh, those uh, canoe trippers and video creators have made. Uh, I do some things different, um, but that's, you know, mostly just a personal choice. So this is basically uh, outlining how I do things and I wouldn't call it so much advice, although, uh, as an experienced canoe tripper, I guess it is advice to someone just starting out. So Maddie's first question is, have you ever seen bears on your solo trip? So Maddie, I've never seen bears on a solo trip. That said, I think it's more likely that a person would see bears on a solo trip. I have seen bears on group trips and uh, never too close, but that happens as well. Uh, I have also been in my tent at night and heard noises that quite likely were bears when I was solo, but didn't actually see any. So how do I be prepared for bears? The truth is the quieter you are, the more likely you're gonna have an encounter with wildlife, whether it's moose, bear, wolves, you know, chipmunks or squirrels. If they don't know you're there, then there's a good chance you're gonna cross paths. So I can tell you a funny story about bears though, and it's that a couple years ago when I was doing the Northwest Loop canoe trip, and that's the most Northwest canoe route in Algonquin Park, um, I was traveling along Beaver Creek, and it was the longest portage section in that you know section of trail. And I wasn't feeling that great that day, so I did a multiple trip on the portage. I always travel across with my pack first if I do more than one trip. That way I can get a good layout of the land and you know look for obstacles as well as wildlife. I figure if I have the canoe on my head and I'm alone, uh, there's a greater chance I could get lost or stumble or you know something and I want to see exactly where I'm going if it's the first time that I'm actually traveling. So anyhow, so I travel across once with my backpack and then hike the portage back to get the canoe and if I remember right I may have even done it in three trips because I wasn't feeling well. So I uh, if that was the case, I would have carried my food bag and maybe something else, my paddles or whatever, um, the second time. But regardless, the third time when I was uh, walking across, uh, I had the canoe on my head and was, you know, just looking down at the trail. And about halfway along the portage, there was this uh, big mound of fresh bear poop. And I know it wasn't there before because it was where there were a lot of tree roots and you definitely had to look where you were going. Um, so it's very likely that within the time that I had walked along that stretch, a bear walked onto the portage, left his mark and kept going. So I didn't see him. I saw traces of him and I will say that it was kind of freaky, uh, especially at that point having the canoe on my head and not being able to look around as well. So um, I think being prepared for encounters with wildlife is, uh, you know, just a, a part of the game. So Maddie's next question is, what can I do to be prepared for any potential dangerous wildlife that she comes across? So there's all kinds of things you can do to be prepared. Uh, but first, I think 
I should say that uh, I'm actually more concerned with uh, the dangerous animals that uh, people don't think about as dangerous animals, and uh, that would be the other people that might be on the trail. And they are likely more predictable, so I would say try to be prepared for that as well. But as far as wildlife, uh, yeah, to just touch on my point again, is just becoming educated on, you know, what animals to be wary of and which ones not to be, and uh, learn a little bit about their behavior. So if you see them, you can identify what they're doing and possibly how you should react. Um, you know, for instance, if you just see a bear on the trail, what to do. Uh, if you see a bear stand up to look at you, what to do. Uh, if you see a bear uh, biting into the air towards you, what you should do. And I'm not going to get into any of this kind of stuff in this video. It, the information's out there online, but yeah, it's just about being prepared and becoming educated. Uh, it's one thing that I used to advocate a lot for, and it's just that skills development that we get. Uh, nowadays, people tend to just jump out into the wilderness and uh, believe that they can take their you know, day-to-day -day living skills and that they apply. A lot of them do, and I don't want to take away from, you know, anybody's way of doing things. Uh, I have a lot of respect for people just getting outdoors, but there is definitely some skill, and uh, it's important to just take the time to learn. So what do I do to prepare? One of the things is uh, I always have bear spray. Now, this is a very worn out can uh, it's actually expired um, so that's something that uh, is important to know and pay attention to when you buy this stuff it doesn't last forever it has expiration date something a lot of people don't know about me is that I used to work in law enforcement and carried pepper spray on the job uh, one thing a lot of people don't do is test their bear spray and it's important to do that once in a while you obviously don't want to drain it and when you do you don't want to spray into the wind but the canisters themselves can fail so just being ready uh, it's important just to you know if you have this stuff just give it a little spray uh, once in a while right before a trip just to make sure that the the aerosol in it is still working so then with this bear spray what i do is i always have it accessible so now i want to say always I'm like everybody, sometimes I get to camp and I forget. I take my life jacket off or, you know, my pack and I put it down and it's not on me. But when I'm solo tripping, I usually set this down near me or have it in my pocket uh, just in case. Now you can get little holsters, basically, little, you know, they're, I think they're made out of uh, neoprene that they just slide into so they can be on your belt. Uh, that would be great for me. I'll just show you. For me, my uh, PFD has a pocket at the front, and so I will often just slide the canister in there, and so then it's right on my chest as I'm traveling. Okay, so another thing that I do is I hang my food. Uh, I know that there's a lot of people who talk about not hanging their food and never having a problem, but to me it's really important. It would be a quick way to end a trip or ruin a trip if uh, animals were attracted into your camp or got your food at night. So I always hang my food. Um, I also want to say that hanging the food isn't just about protecting your food but it's about protecting the animals because if a bear gets your food it will get the taste of it and then it'll continue visiting that camp and look for human food from then on so it's going to end up becoming a, a tame or a spoiled bear and become a nuisance so i always hang my food bag and i use the pulley system to hang it so basically what that is, is I have a, a line of paracord with a, a small three quarter inch pulley attached. Uh, I throw the pulley up over a branch, uh, tie the, the tail end of the paracord to a tree. Then I pass a rope through the pulley, tie it to the bag. I hoist 
the pulley up and then I pull the other line that the food bag is attached to over to another tree and it has a pendulum effect that pulls the bag away from the tree. Uh, ideally you want the bag to be 10 feet up or higher and 10 feet out from the tree. And so then the next thing is uh, I would say keep your campsite clean so make sure you do your dishes at the end of the night clean them all up, put them in your food bag, and put it away. Just don't leave any anything that's going to attract any animals. And keep in mind that that's not necessarily food, it's items that smell unique. Uh, they're gonna be curious to what that smell is and go and investigate it. So that's why we advise people not to put anything interesting in your tent or hammock either. So things like your toothpaste, don't put it in your tent with you at night because that smell could attract something. Might just be a chipmunk, but it might be something that you really don't want checking you out. Okay, so Maddie's next question is, uh, her longest portage is uh, 1,850 meters long, which is probably the largest portage that she has ever done. And how do I tackle that? There's a saying, uh, I believe it was Bill Mason who said, uh, what is it? Uh, anyone who says they don't hate portages is crazy. Uh, something along those lines. Well, I might be crazy. I don't hate portages. For me, it's a way to get out, stretch my legs, and I like to hike and I like to see inside of the woods. So, um, yeah, the carrying of everything and the soreness on my shoulders and the bugs biting the back of my neck I could live without, but uh, that's just a part of the experience. As for long portages, I've been on my share. So how do I cope with them? Well, first of all, I'd say uh, let your pride go when you're out doing something like canoe tripping, regardless of whether it's solo or with a friend. Uh, humility is one of the most important things. You need to be able to work at your own pace and, you know, push yourself, but not push yourself too far or too hard that you end up injuring yourself or, you know, getting heat stroke or getting lost or making bad decisions along the way. So in Algonquin Park itself, there are actually often on the long portages rest stops, basically, where the park wardens have uh, attached a, they'll take a long branch or a small tree that they cut and they'll run it between two trees. Uh, they'll chain it or nail it in place and it's about oh, probably six or seven feet high. So that's basically so you can take your canoe, you're carrying your canoe and you can just walk up to it and lean it back and then you can rest the bow up on uh, you know that cross piece and you can have a little rest, a break. Um, so definitely that's worth it. You can, you know, take the time and just do that and catch your breath and rub your shoulders, have a drink, um, put some more bug spray on, whatever you need to do. Uh, so that would be what I would say is, you know, have, have a little bit of humility. Don't be too, uh, you know, uh, eager to push yourself as hard as you can uh, and just make the most of it. Um, my biggest concern on the portages is when I'm on my own, uh, being a video creator, I sometimes have, depending on what I bring, I sometimes have a camera bag, and so I have to do a multiple trip. I can't carry the canoe and paddles and food bag and my big dry bag backpack and camera bag. Sometimes I can, depending on the trip, but often I have to do it in two trips. So for me, it's often the worry of what do I leave at the portage when I hike? I've never had an issue, but like I said already, it's the people out there on the trail that uh, I think are the most unpredictable. Uh, I like to think that canoe trippers are good people, but again, I can't speak for everyone. So that's always my concern. So if you end up doing it in multiple carries, just, you know, be aware of where you leave it. Uh, if you can carry your stuff in, you know, 10 or 20 feet, so it's not right by the lake. That's what I like to do. So if someone's paddling by, it's not standing right out that, you know, there's gear lying around and nobody watching it. Um, yeah. So 
just take those kind of precautions and uh, make sure you stay hydrated. So Maddie has a follow-up question. Is being alone difficult on a portage? I don't want to say it's more difficult because there are some portages that are short and sweet and you know you the the loading and the unloading of the canoe is the most difficult part um you know i told you about the you know the bear poop on the portage and that didn't make it more difficult but being alone it made me want to get off the portage pretty quick uh i would say you know it's just the the again being prepared and uh you know try to make the most of it and you know if you have that pepper spray with you then you know you have something against wildlife or people and you know 99.99 percent .99 likely you won't need it but it's something that could give you a peace of mind so um, physically, yeah, you want to make sure that you want to be able to lift your gear on your own, uh, get that canoe up on your shoulders, uh, and then be able to hike, especially if it's a, a 1800 meter portage, that's, that's a good hike. Uh, give yourself enough time in the day as well, so that if you need to, you can you know, sit down and have a drink and eat some trail mix or something like that and, you know, just relax for a little while after you do it. Okay, so the next question is, do I have any meal suggestions? Um, yeah, uh, freeze-dried meals. Uh, I would, uh, I always bring a freeze-dried meal and uh, sometimes I don't eat it. Sometimes it's just there, but I bring it because if the weather goes bad or, you know, who knows, I get sick or hurt or something that I'm stuck out for another day that I have at least one more meal uh, that I you know can not be starving when I'm stuck for an extra day um, so freeze-dried meals are really good they're good because uh, typically they taste half decent some taste really good uh, and also you might have food to prepare but you might find that the the trail takes you a little bit longer and you you know, you rock up to camp just before dark and not enough time to really cook. So freeze-dried meals are ready in about 10 minutes, so they're really convenient. Uh, as far as other meals, uh, pasta is a really good one. You can easily uh, dry out your own sauce. Just cook your sauce, put it on some uh, parchment paper on a cookie sheet. You can stick it in the oven, uh, warm up the oven first, and then stick it in and turn the heat off. Uh, you don't want it to burn and this is my process and then monitor it because if the edges start to darken you know you want to just open the door a little and let some of the heat out and just let it dry out if you have a food dehydrator even better because it'll dry it out in a real slow process uh, then when you're out on the trail you'll have uh, basically uh, like a fruit leather that's tomato sauce and you can just add water and cook your pasta and you're good to go so another meal that I tend to bring, and sometimes I feel like it's a kind of a cheat, but uh, it's super convenient, is uh, I'll pack up just some sandwiches. So uh, in Algonquin Park, I'll stop in Huntsville, uh, right at the corner of uh, Highway 60 there, and I'll go into the grocery store and get some, uh, some fresh rolls and lunch meat and uh, sometimes some sliced cheese, and they have, you know, like mustard in the packets. I take that and then the first day uh, around lunchtime I have a super easy nice lunch to have and you know little to no waste. So other meals I like to bring are cliff bars and trail mix, uh, sometimes other types of protein bars, uh, just quick snacks and to be honest I tend not to eat like breakfasts when I'm out in Algonquin Park or on canoe trips but go for something like that and just have trail mix or uh, you know some sort of protein bar cliff bar uh, some you know drink it down with some coffee I use instant coffee out there and it's good enough for me um, I know a lot of other people like to have a big breakfast out but for me 
uh, having something that's you know like a bar or just trail mix I don't have to clean up afterwards so it's just you know open the pack eat it and then get out on the water so Maddie's next question is uh, if I have any suggestions for making meals uh, or doing freeze-dried meals and I covered that a bit with the, the pasta sauce now you can do other things the same way chili I've done and it works out really good uh, same you just make it on the stove and then stick it in the oven or dehydrator and let it go it's a really easy uh, dried meal that uh, people can start as beginners um, easy to make before leaving and drying out and then easy to uh, cook when you're out there it's the same you just just add some water and uh, let it sit for a little while it'll rehydrate and you can uh, just add a little bit more water you know as you need it just until you get it the consistency that you want so other meals might be uh, now I'm a meat eater so often depending on the weather if I know it's gonna be incredibly hot I won't uh, but often I'll bring steak and I just freeze it the night before I keep it uh, as cold as I can on ice for the drive out to the park and uh, then I cook it the first night so I would have my sandwiches that I pack in from the Huntsville store and yeah that would be for lunch and then that night I would have let's say steak and potatoes so it's always the you know the heaviest meal um, and to me it's the heavy meal that I want to get rid of first but also it's going to fill me and give me a lot of fuel for the next day okay so next question is uh, do I often bring a satellite phone or emergency device uh, Yes and no. So, so I do have a older model in reach device and I will bring this from time to time depending on the trip. Uh, in reach offers a subscription service so I can pay for the subscription for a short period of time. I don't have to pay for it for the whole year and then I'm able to uh, take this and have some peace of mind. So uh, I brought this out in the Northwest Loop trip because I heard it's isolated and the portages were very long on you know each stage and I figured there wouldn't be uh, many people if I was injured or anything that you know this would be uh, required also I brought it when I went up into Wabakimi for the week and uh, that was a a trip where I was dropped off by float plane and then picked up so it was for peace of mind then but also to let the float plane know when it was time to come and get me. Uh, for someone just starting out and uh, pro you know I don't want to it's always tricky when giving advice to young women I don't want to say especially a young woman but I'm going to in this case uh, especially a young woman I think that uh, there are some you know risks that are a little bit higher for you and I think that for peace of mind um, I would advise to get something like this in case something was to happen and you know you need to call for help the nice thing about this type of device is that some spot devices is just an emergency beacon where it calls for help um, others like this you can actually send a text to someone and let them know that you're okay every night or let them know that you got to a certain stage of your trip and that you're okay you know having a great time and you can receive their reply just like SMS. I would advise anyone starting out to have something like this uh, especially traveling solo uh, you know people do get lost even in Algonquin Park so good to have okay so the last question is what do I do in case of emergency like a sprained ankle so I didn't bring out my first first aid kit and truth is I changed my first aid kit all the time depending on where I'm going how long and make sure that it's updated um, first aid and dealing with accidents and emergencies like that is one of you know the important things that we need to consider when traveling alone in the backcountry or a wilderness area uh, 
personally, I did the medical first responder training, so I have a very high level of first aid skill. I also have a lifetime experience in training in martial arts, um, which seems unrelated, but uh, I have a relatively high pain threshold and have had some, you know, relatively, you know, painful injuries. Um, okay, and why that's important is because, uh, you know, I think that the more uh, exposure you have to something, uh, the better or greater your uh, comfort zone with dealing with it is. And so, looking at some of the minor injuries like sprained ankle and uh, you know dislocations possibly or something like that or minor burns uh, cuts um, I think that just having experience dealing with that type of thing makes you more comfortable and if you're alone uh, you're not gonna panic you know or less likely to panic so uh, again, it comes down to that skills development. So another thing with injuries, and it brings me back to having a device like an inReach, is that if you do have an injury, having some sort of device that you can contact someone to let them know, I think that's really important. Um, aside from that, uh, you know, advice is always to stay put. Uh, and I think that is the best advice. Uh, however, I think, uh, you always also have to just consider, uh, you know, can I get out? Can I get to a place where I'm more likely to be seen? And uh, take those into consideration because if you're on a remote trail somewhere and no one's going to come by for, you know, a week, uh, it might be worth the effort to try to, you know, get to the edge of the lake so that maybe someone passing by will see you and you can wave to them. So also we're talking about emergencies in the backcountry and I think it's important uh, to touch on what you should have with you. So um, so I'll show, so within my uh, life jacket I have a whistle that I use. This is actually, it's made by the company Fox 40. So it's a Fox 40 whistle, it's very loud. Um, it's a P-less whistle, so there's no P inside of it. It just makes the noise, right? Um, also, I have a small air horn, okay? So these type of signaling devices, you're not gonna mistake what they sound like and, you know, uh, it'll draw a lot of attention. The air horn, uh, I probably should have mentioned when it comes to wildlife uh, sound, Something like an air horn like this is also a great way to uh, scurry away any animals that you might not want around camp. I think the greatest thing that you should know about injuries is trying to prevent them in the first place. So pack yourself a pair of cheap leather gloves in your bag so that when you're preparing your fire you can wear gloves and avoid burning yourself or cutting yourself. Um, don't use them, don't reach into the fire thinking that you have gloves on and it won't matter. You know, just for those day-to-day -day things that, you know, might be uh, uh, more risky because you're out in the middle of nowhere and by yourself. So have that set of gloves. Um, in, there's injuries that we need to think about as well, like uh, uh, sunburn and heat stroke. So make sure you wear a hat and bring sunscreen. So talking about hats, uh, You've seen my hat before. Uh, this hat is an Akubra, and it's an Australian hat. Um, I picked up there 20 years ago when I lived in Australia. And what I like about this hat, and I'd recommend for the type of hat when spending time in the outdoors, is that you want a full, you know, round-brimmed hat, not just a front-peaked hat, because you want to protect your ears and the back of your neck as well. Um, if you don't have a hat that's round like this, you know, it could be like a Tilly hat or something similar. Uh, if you have to wear a baseball cap style hat, then what you can do is just bring uh, like a t-shirt or a bandana and 
stick it on your head and then your hat so you have something hanging down over your ears and the back of your neck. So I guess there are a few other tips and tricks that I'd like to talk about when solo canoe tripping uh, in Algonquin Park or anywhere. Uh, one of the first is to bring more than one way to start a fire. So what I usually bring is I have a large ferro rod. Um, what I like about the ferro rod is that they work when they're wet. So you can just easily just wipe them off and get a spark. What I don't like is that if your tinder is wet, it's gonna be a lot of work to get it going. Okay, so the second fire starter that I bring is stormproof matches. And you buy them and they come in a waterproof case Okay, and then inside is your matches. And because it's waterproof, I keep a little bit of cotton at the end and an extra striker. Okay, so if you haven't seen stormproof matches before, you can see it's got a really long, what I would call the burner, and you know, uh, halfway is the wooden stick. Okay, so let me just. Right. And so that's what it looks like. And what's nice about them is that they burn for a long time. Not a long, long time, but typically long enough that you can get a fire started, even in the rain, with just one or two of these. Okay, so stormproof matches. Definitely something that I would recommend. So I got these at, I believe, Princess Auto, but you can get them probably at Canadian Tire and other stores to shop around. I think I paid $10 for this and there were about 50 matches in it when I got them. Um, yeah, inexpensive piece of kit that uh, can definitely take the stress of starting a fire away. Now, I think it was Les Drought years ago on Survivor Man that he talked about fire starting and survival, and I believe he said that you should have three ways of starting a fire. So I do bring a lighter as well, and I don't know when I have used the lighter. I'm sure I have. Uh, usually I get the fire started with the ferro rod or the stormproof matches, but it's good to have that foolproof way, a lighter that you can really just uh, put everything, all your attention in and, you know, get something going and build up that fire to, you know, cook your dinner or give you some uh, peace of mind and safety at night. Okay, so the next thing that I would say or recommend is, you know, how to prepare your wood to have a fire. And I've been using a Boreal 21 bow saw. They're made in Canada and really are a great saw. This year I started, I tried to use the uh, the Baco. Um, this is a Baco Laplander. I believe I bought this and the knife that goes with it as a kit for $30. So it's, you know, very similar to like a silky saw. Um, but I don't know if I'm going to switch to this. Uh, so far, so good with when using it. Um, it's a, a lot smaller and lighter, so I haven't used it on an actual canoe trip yet. I've used it just uh, out at my bush camp and thought it was good there. I'm going to pack it the next trip I go and find out if, you know, there's limitations with it. It is smaller, so definitely the size of wood is going to be reduced. But in reality, you don't need a huge fire. Um, you don't need to cut huge pieces of wood you know, to cook or just give yourself some light and peace of mind at night. The next thing that I bring, and this is uh, also for wood processing around the camp, uh, it is my heaviest piece of kit that I bring, and it's my axe. Uh, this one is a Husqvarna Carpenter's Axe, and I just really like uh, the shape of it, uh, the weight. Um, it has a very sharp blade uh, that I keep sharp. I have a sharpener. Um, and for me, it's also peace of mind. Uh, you know, I can be a bit of a coward when out alone, you know, in my tent, uh, in somewhere isolated. And to have this beside me in the tent just gives me a little bit of extra peace of mind. Uh, truth is, and I know it, that if uh, a bear decided to 
try to drag me out of my tent, this is probably not going to stop it. But all the same, I would put up a bit of a fight and, uh, you know, give the bear his money's worth. So, Maddie, the next thing that I want to talk to you about is one of the key things that you should have when going out on your own, um, and that is shelter. So, I have a 10 foot by 10 foot sill nylon tarp, which is the easiest a way to create a shelter. Um, I do bring a tent or hammock. I've switched to a hammock last year, but the tarp is, you know, always packed near the top of my pack. So if I have to get off the water because of rain or thunderstorm or whatever, I have something that I can easily wrap around me and, you know, shelter myself to stay warm and dry. A couple years ago, I stopped packing the fly of my tent and only packed the sill nylon tarp. I use it as the fly on nice, clear, warm nights. I don't cover the tent with this and I just have the, you know, the fly screen mesh over me. Um, that takes a little bit of getting used to sleeping under the stars, but uh, the tarp is just a bit more versatile and I found packing this instead of the fly uh, is just, it saves some weight and uh, the tarp is a, a bit more versatile. Okay, so there's one more thing that I'd like to talk about, uh, also a fundamental piece of equipment, and that's your water filter. So I don't know if there's anywhere in the world where you can still drink water and not worry about what might be in it. Maybe in the far, far north, uh, but certainly not in Algonquin. Um, so I have two different types of water filters that I bring, um, not both on the same trip, but one or the other. Uh, I'm going to show you the one that I actually tend not to bring, uh, but it is a popular one. So, um, so the one is a Sawyer, it's Sawyer Squeeze. I did bring this on uh, my 10 day trip in Algonquin. Uh, but I brought it as well as my gravity feed and this one I just had always sitting at the top of the uh, the food bag so if I was on a long paddle I could just uh, and ran out of water I could pull this out and filter some water on the go um, this system I'm sure you're familiar with it uh, you just fill the bag with water and then basically just to open it up and squeeze the bag and the filtered water comes out so uh, very convenient the system that I always bring is also a Sawyer filter um, but it's the gravity feed so there's a, a clean water bag and a dirty water bag and then a filter in between so you fill up the dirty side and then the wa dirty water runs down through the filter and fills the clean bag and that's where you get your drinking water from. Um, this is actually always the first thing I do when I get to camp is fill up the filter and get the water going and then I'll set up camp. Okay so there's really only two other things that I think I want to talk to you about. Um, actually I'm thinking of more but uh, so I'll say bring a good map and compass okay uh, definitely important you're traveling on your own if there's nobody out there and you get lost you need to be able to navigate back um, the easiest way to do that is uh, just follow the shoreline if you go across the lake it's easy to get spun around but if you look at the map follow the shoreline just hug the shore you should be fine traveling solo that's the way you should be traveling on water anyway so the next piece of advice that I'd like to talk to you about is definitely more personal preference but it's choosing the right paddle um, a lot of people like the otter tail paddle in and around Algonquin uh, I actually think it's the wrong choice and let me show you why okay so hopefully you can see me um, under the deck here and in the shade now this isn't a otter tail I actually don't own one this is a beaver tail paddle um, an otter tail is actually more narrow in the blade and comes to a point okay uh, and then you have the beaver tail which it starts to uh, become more squat and a little bit wider and then you move into a paddle like this one uh, which 
I would call like an expedition style paddle, which is a broader blade and a little bit shorter as well in the, the length of the blade. So the reason why I like these style paddle is that uh, there's a lot of places uh, around Ontario, uh, it's just our, the way our, the nature of our waterways, uh, that it gets really shallow. And so uh, I wish I had an otter tail to uh, demonstrate clearly, but just keep in mind that it would be a narrower blade. But you can see that if I put the beaver tail on top of the expedition, it's a lot narrower. Right, so I lose about, uh, what, probably an inch of blade width all up. And with the otter tail, I'd probably lose another inch. So what happens is that because the otter tail is has a longer, narrower blade, it is better in open water uh, because you can get a, a nice long blade into the water and it'll help you steer the boat. But when you get into shallow water, you can imagine if the water is only a foot deep and your blade is, you know, a foot and a half, two feet and narrow, you have a lot less surface area to propel you through the water. And what people end up doing is digging into the bottom of the, you know, the lake or the river and, you know, push themselves through and damage the waterway. Now, I can think of a lot of places in Algonquin where it gets shallow like that. Uh, you know, that Beaver Creek up in the Northwest Loop. Uh, there was another lake up there where the entire lake was shallow. Another area is between uh, Hambone Lake and Daisy at the portage on the Daisy Lake side. It can get very narrow in there, or sorry, it can get very shallow in there. Um, also the Tim River uh, between Tim Lake and Roseberry Lake can get quite shallow in spots. So for me, I would much rather have a wider blade paddle in and around Algonquin Park. Um, I personally, I really love the Bending Branches brand of paddles. I think it's great woodwork. Um, my last one, uh, this new one of mine, um, it's called the Sunburst and it's got a carbon fiber shaft. Now it's a premium paddle, uh, not for everyone, but it's very lightweight, looks great. Uh, it has their uh, rock guard all the way around. Uh, this paddle has gone through a lot and, you know, still working really well and in good shape. Chances are, I don't know if you're going to be renting a paddle, but chances are you'll likely get a beaver tail style paddle or something similar, and that's absolutely fine. But uh, for me, I would definitely say stay away from the otter tail paddles and, uh, you know, the fact that they steer better, I don't think that's much of an issue. For me, it's about uh, going forward and uh, a wider blade paddle is uh, is definitely going to do that a lot better. You can just look at the uh, sprint canoe and kayak athletes and the shapes of their paddles. Um, their sport is made to go fast in a straight line and, uh, you know, create as much momentum in the water as they can so uh, their paddles are very similar in shape to this style. The next thing and the last thing that I want to talk to you about is uh, it has to do with safety and just traveling on the water. I've already touched on it. Um, stick to the shoreline, don't cross a lake. I have more than once looked out at the water and it's been calm and I've thought I'm going to just cut across and I've gotten a third of the way out and though either the waves or wind has picked up or it was just an optical illusion and bad from the start but been on the water and wishing I wasn't there so um, stick to the shore and always uh, you know if it's going to take you 10 minutes longer of paddling so be it you know it's much better to take the 10 minutes more time than put yourself at risk on the water. Also always wear your PFD, your life jacket. Um, it's no good to you if it's on the you know the floor of your boat so stick it on even if it's hot just you know tough it out and just be safe with it on. And 
lastly is just prepare your canoe so that it's balanced well and one thing that you can actually see in all of my videos is that I have rope attached to the bow of my boat and also to the to the carrying yoke um, and that's not just for aesthetics I have that rope uh, so that I can line my boat if I need to, but also if I do capsize, I can use it as a aid to, you know, for a self rescue. With rentals, they're not going to be set up that way, but it's easy to just uh, get yourself a piece of rope about, uh, you know, a meter and a half or two meters long, uh, tie the ends together with a good knot that won't slip, and just keep it as a loop. Um, if you capsize, you can just you know, feed it through your yoke and then you have an aid that you can stick your foot in when you're in the water and help you get back up into the boat. Uh, the same process can be done at the, the bow or the stern. Okay, so I've done a lot of talking on the back deck. Um, I hope you got something from this. I hope that this answers your questions. Uh, solo tripping can be a lot of fun. Uh, I think the biggest challenge at start is just being out there alone and uh, getting over that uncomfortable feeling of uh, being alone in a wilderness area uh, once you get past that then I think it's a you know it's a great place to be so that said I also want to say that I've done my share of solo tripping solo hiking canoeing whatever it is and in most cases, I found that I have stood out at beautiful places and looked out at the landscape and wished that I had somebody there to share it with. So although there's this trend and this interest in getting out to do things solo, um, also consider you know the importance of having company with you and weigh up whether the challenge of doing it alone uh, outweighs just the experience and sharing those kinds of memories. Okay, so that's it. That's my take on solo canoe tripping in Algonquin Park or really solo tripping anywhere. Um, I hope I answered your questions. I hope I've given you some uh, you know, insight into the way I do things. Feel free to leave a comment and uh, if you have any questions, I'll look out for them and hopefully give you an answer. Okay, and for everybody else watching, if this is your first time to the channel, please subscribe. If you like the video, give it the thumbs up, and thanks for watching.